everybody. It's a Friday afternoon coming to you from school here. I got a new chair. It's like I'm in a Cadillac. This is Chapter 19, Drifting Towards Disunion. Let's get started. All right, a few key points, as always, here. First of all, the compromise approach to slavery finally fails completely. Uh, also, the Supreme Court is now involved, uh, and they, in fact, will say that slavery is okay everywhere, even in free states, and they do this on the basis of property rights. Uh, third, there is a new sectional party that emerges in the Republican Party, and their victory, Abraham Lincoln's victory in 1860, was just too much for the South, and that leads to the immediate secession. Let's talk about the impact of literature on the outbreak of the Civil War. First of all, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852 was widely read. It was incredibly popular. And what it did was it actually provided for Northerners and folks who hadn't really experienced slavery firsthand just a glimpse at what the actual institution was like. And so that creates a lot of sympathy towards African Americans and a lot of anti-South uh, sentiment is created as well. This was published abroad in uh, Britain and France. Uh, another example would be Hinton R. Helper's The Impending Crisis of the South in 1857. In this, he actually tried to use statistics to show that non-slaveholding whites were the ones who suffered the most from slavery. And while that may be flawed, it certainly did add to this abolitionist feeling. Here is Harriet Beecher Stowe. On the cover of her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, right here, you can see the overseer, Simon Legree, the hated Simon Legree, uh, for his abuse, physical abuse of slaves, that is. Okay, so last chapter we looked at Stephen Douglas and his push for popular sovereignty in the West and, and maybe his reasons for that. Uh, now let's look at sort of the growing population, in this case in Kansas. Most of the folks who went there, they went there to become farmers in Kansas. But there was the New England Emigrant Aid Company, which had paid people to go to Kansas for the hopes of it becoming a free state. Now, in 1855, there was enough folks in Kansas to... Uh, elect its own legislature, and many pro-slavery people came up from Missouri to vote in this, and they eventually will win the election, and so the slavery supporters will create their own government at the Shawnee Mission, and they claim that to be legitimate. Abolitionists, on the other hand, uh, see through this, and they in, they in fact say that that government is not the true government, and they set up their own government in Topeka. So in 1856 now, you have two governments that are claiming to be legit, that don't recognize the other, and uh, violence and conflict break out. So a group of pro-slavery writers had burned part of the abolitionist town of Lawrence, and this is the beginning of this bleeding Kansas incident. Okay, so one turn to the mix, John Brown, a fanatical abolitionist who in 1856, alongside several of his sons, hacked to death five pro-slavery folks at Pottawatomie Creek in response to pro-slavery events that occurred at St. Lawrence. 1857, now Kansas is actually ready to apply for statehood. And at that point, pro-slavery politicians had created the Compton Constitution. And people who needed to vote on this constitution, and the only way they could vote on it was either with slavery or without slavery. So you're voting on the constitution regardless. Uh, and if you did vote on it without slavery, then the slaves who existed there previously would be protected. So there would still be slaves within the territory. Here is John Brown. And so because of the strange voting procedure, many abolitionists boycotted the voting outright, and the Constitution was passed and approved to include slavery. President Buchanan supported the Constitution. Senator Stephen Douglas, on the other hand, strongly opposed this document, and a compromise was eventually reached. The people of Kansas were able to vote on the Lee Compton Constitution itself, and it was revoked by the abolitionists, but Kansas ended up remaining a territory until 1861, when the southern states seceded from the Union. So it seems that the civility of the Senate is gone by 1856 as an abolitionist Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts gave a very provoking speech which condemned slavery and supporters of slavery. And within that, he actually personally insulted Senator Andrew Butler of South Carolina. Now, you probably know by now that in early America, insults to people's honor don't generally end very peacefully, we'll just say. And in fact, it didn't happen here either. On May 22, 1856, Butler's nephew, Preston Brooks, beat Sumner with a cane to unconsciousness. I mean, he, his injuries were severe, and I think that alone shows how impassioned Northerners and Southerners were for their cause, for one person to physically attack another in the Senate. It just kind of blows my mind. Uh, Please note that Northerners applauded the speech, and I suppose the content of the speech, and perhaps even the insult within the speech, while Southerners applauded the attack. In fact, uh, many people replaced Butler's uh, cane with new canes as he had broken his. Here's a picture uh, that you may have seen from the book. It's pretty iconic. Here's a picture of the cane itself that was used. 
Okay, so the election of 1856, we'll put James Buchanan versus John C. Fremont, uh, as well as Miller Fillmore. We'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, but Old Buck, I guess uh, some folks used to pronounce Buchanan, Buck Cannon. I'd never heard that before, to be honest with you. Now, as a Democrat, their platform ran on this idea of popular sovereignty. That makes sense. It's a Democratic concept. The Republicans, however, will run on this idea of preventing the extension of slavery. Now, Millard Fillmore will run under the American Party, also known as the Know Nothing Party. Um, this is basically a nativist platform, uh, at, you know, in the sense that they are responding to the upsurge of immigration, particularly Irish and Germans that occurred. There's John C. Fremont, the Pathfinder. You might recall he was actually present when the Bear Flag Revolt occurred in California. Just happened to be there. And here's James Buchanan. Okay, so Old Buck wins in 1856, and this does prevent secession for the time being. The Democrats, I suppose, are uh, satisfied for now. Uh, but it's still a victory for the Republican Party. Now, you can see here that they are gaining a lot of support in what used to be traditional Whig territory. Now, by 1860, they'll have enough support in the North and Northeast to win the election. And obviously, that is the final straw that breaks up the Union. Okay, let's talk about the Dred Scott decision here and the impact that it had. First of all, Dred Scott was a slave who had lived with his master for five years in Illinois and then in Wisconsin Territory. And as a result of that, he thought he, had, he was justified to sue for freedom. And so uh, he does that in Dred Scott versus Stanford. Now, the Supreme Court will rule first that because Scott was black and he was a slave, he therefore wasn't a citizen and did not have the right to sue in court. They later rule that the Fifth Amendment will forbid Congress, or anyone for that matter, from depriving people of their property without due process of law. And so not only does this make the Missouri Compromise of 1820 unconstitutional, it also raises the point that slavery is therefore legal everywhere, even territories that outlaw or states that outlaw the institution because you can't take people's property away. Here is Dred Scott. And this is Supreme Court Justice Roger Taney. He uh, delivered the majority opinion. So in 1857, there's another financial panic. Uh, this is due to the overspeculation in the West, as well as inflation related to the California gold and rush. The North is hit very hard, and the South continues to flourish with its cotton trade. Uh, now, there's a real push to actually give out free land to pioneers in the West, and this does pass Congress in 1860, providing land at 25 cents an acre. Uh, several groups oppose this, notably the industrialists in the North, who thought that it would drain workers, and Southerners, who thought that the West would fill up with free soilers and therefore uh, prevent the extension of slavery. Uh, James Buchanan vetoed this. In addition to that, there is a new tariff in 1857 which will lower import taxes to about 20%. Now, in 1860, Republicans run on these two issues, uh, protecting the unprotected through the tariff and in providing land and farms to those who don't have that through the Homestead Act. And that will come back in 1862. Now, before Lincoln runs for president in 1860, he is involved in the senatorial race in 1858 against Stephen Douglas. And so Lincoln will challenge Douglas. There's Lincoln on the left, by the way, and Douglas on the right. Lincoln will challenge Douglas to a series of seven debates that were arranged from August to October of 1858. And these collectively are just called the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Now, the most famous of these debates happened at Freeport, Illinois. And during this, Lincoln asked Douglas, well, what if the people of a territory should vote down slavery? So directly challenging this idea of popular sovereignty and raising the question about the Supreme Court and their decision that slavery can't really be denied on the basis of property. Douglas's response to this became known as the Freeport Doctrine. And in that, he argued that no matter how the Supreme Court ruled, slavery would stay down if the people voted it down. Laws to protect slavery would have to be voted on by the territorial legislatures. And so this is uh, appealing to the people, and Douglas will win the senatorial election, but Lincoln does win the popular vote. Okay, back to John Brown. Now, history textbooks like to ask the question of whether or not you think he's a murderer or a martyr, and I'll let you decide on that. But I can tell you that John Brown had actually planned on invading the South, and he planned on arming slaves and creating this insurrection and actually establishing a free black state. So in October of 1859, to make this happen, he seized the federal arsenal on Harper's Ferry, and unfortunately for him, many of his supporters failed to show up, and as a result of that, he was caught, and he was sentenced to death by hanging. So when he dies, he lives on for the cause of abolition as a martyr, as I said before. And here is a painting of John Brown leaving a courthouse. I don't believe this actually happened, uh, but notice that as he's leaving, even though he's being sentenced to death, he has time to pause and kiss this young African-American child. 
obviously presenting him in a positive light. So to further escalate this conflict that's been happening amongst the sections in 1860, the Democratic Party splits, and so Stephen Douglas runs as the Democrat, or I suppose North Democrat, and John C. Breckinridge is nominated as a Southern Democrat. There's also the Constitutional Union Party, formed by former Whigs and no nothings who nominate John Bell. And obviously the Republican Party will run Abraham Lincoln in 1860, and their platform, while they do represent the West, I suppose, as a section, their platform is appealing to as many people as possible. And so they support the non-extension of slavery, which appeals to free soilers. They support a protective tariff, which appeals to northern manufacturers and any Whigs hanging around. They support a non-abridgment of rights to uh, appease immigrants. They support a Pacific Railroad. They support internal improvements at federal expense, and they support free homesteads for farmers. Southerners said that if Abraham Lincoln was elected president, then the Union would split. Okay, so in 1860, Lincoln does win the electoral vote, but not the popular vote. In fact, 60% of the nation had voted for another candidate. Ten southern states did not even allow Lincoln to appear on the ballot. And with the victory of Lincoln, South Carolina now has a concrete reason to secede. They can make the case that no state in the South even supports this candidate. Therefore, he's not there president, so to say. Uh, the Republicans do have the executive office, but they do not have a majority in Congress, and they don't have the Supreme Court either. And here is that electoral map. As you can see, Lincoln has tremendous support across the North and the West, uh, but nothing below the Mason-Dixon line whatsoever. And so following this, secession occurs. And in December of 1860, South Carolina is the first state to leave. And following that, several other states, including Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas, will follow suit. In February of 1861, the Confederate States of America are formed. Jefferson Davis will be chosen president of this. Now, James Buchanan is still the lame duck president at this point, and he didn't really do anything at all about secession. I don't really know what exactly there is to do about it other than to send the military south and preserve the Union. You can see here in the red the states that did not secede, the Union states. You also can see in sort of the, uh, the lighter blue shade uh, the border states that will not secede. And below that you'll see states that will secede after the fall of Fort Sumner. We'll talk about that in a little bit here. But the bottom, the deep south, the dark blue, these are the original states that seceded beginning in 1860. One last attempt at compromise was made with the Cretendent Amendments to the Constitution. They were designed to appease the south, and they would prohibit slavery in territories north of the 36-30 line. So back to the old Missouri Compromise, south of that, popular sovereignty would be used to decide whether or not slavery would exist there. President Lincoln rejected this amendment, and effectively the nation is on the path for war. And so the southern states seceded, fearing that the Republican Party would threaten their right to own slaves. Uh, and in fact, they felt that they didn't have any say in the election of 1860. They certainly didn't vote for Abraham Lincoln, and therefore they didn't see him as their president. So southerners uh, really hoped to have their own independent nation, and many felt that their secession would be unopposed by the North. So, you know, perhaps the North was too heavily dependent upon the South uh, for their own economic goals as well. Okay, that's all for tonight. Thanks for watching. As always, if you have questions, please feel free to email or just let me know in class. Have a good night.